Divine Truth Documentary Jesus, Mary and Others provide information to people or organizations that produce documentaries. In this video, Jesus is interviewed by Thomas Leder while staying with Thomas and his cameraman Simon. This is session 6, part 2, filmed on the 14th of August 2013 in Malulaba, Queensland, Australia. Um, so, uh, I, I want to say something here about judgment if we can as well. It's very important that a person hearing these words doesn't then revert to the feeling that I'm judging them. I, all I'm doing is telling them the truth about what happens when they pass, that's all. And what I'm saying is that our own definition of love while we're on earth is often very flawed and as a result of, of the flaw, uh, which will need to be corrected at some point in our future, we pass into the spirit world out of harmony with the way God sees things should have been done. And as a result of this disharmony, it, it, it means that we have corrections to make to our own choices and decisions, and those corrections we need to use our will to engage. So what I'm saying is there's no such thing as a permanent judgment, only a temporary one. And I think that is good news for most people on earth actually. Because my, a lot of people in religious forms on earth believe that if you live a life on earth of a certain type and, and let's say it's not been too happy one and then in, you pass over into the spirit world uh, and now you're in maybe a hell type condition because of the lack of love that exists in your soul as a result of the choices you made on earth. Most people and most religions teach that you can't get out of it once you've passed. That's it. That's a permanent condition. And that's not true you can get out of any condition. You can get out of the very worst condition imaginable by becoming more loving and choosing to become more loving in your day-to-day -day life and, in, and, and also choosing to release within from within you the reason why you made such choices, such unloving choices from God's perspective. So I feel that's a very hopeful message rather than a judgmental one. But the reason why it has to be mentioned is that, that there are definitions of love that we have here on earth that are not God's definitions of love is because, because there are many people who pass from the earth to the spirit world who become severely disappointed with their spirit world life because they didn't realize when they were on earth that the decisions they were making would have an effect on their future. And what I'm suggesting to them is that every decision you make on earth that's out of harmony with love has a detrimental effect on your future after you've passed. Conversely, every decision you made in harmony with love, in harmony with a pure desire, in harmony with God's laws of love, results in a positive thing when you pass into your future life after, after this life. Conversely, yeah. Conversely, Conversely, anything that you do in a positive direction in this life that's in harmony with God's love, when you pass, will have a reward in that life. And so it's very important for people to understand that the choices and decisions they make now do have an effect on their future life, as well as having an effect on their life on earth in the future. And if people knew that to a far greater degree, I'm sure far less people would choose to do unloving things. They would instead use their will in a more positive direction. Excellent, thank you. Um, we're going to have to have that definition soon of what God's love is. Sure. But um, I might just want to go to Lou. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of. I've given a short summary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's yeah. pretty hard to short summarize 2,000 years. I think, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, um, okay. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Is Jesus perfect? <laughs> I, I like this question a lot, actually. <laughs> you see, I suppose uh, most people from Christian belief or from a Christian background would assume Jesus is God and therefore assume that Jesus must be perfect because God is perfect sort of thing. But the reality is, as I'm saying, that Jesus is not God. I am not God. I am just a normal human being. Now I have the ability to obtain perfection. 
by becoming at one with God, which is something that I did do in the first century. But it took me until I was 30 to do it. So all the time from from the time I was uh, conceived right the way through to 30 years of age, I was not perfect. And it was only once I became perfected in love, and, it, and again, we need to define perfection. And I think Mary might have given you some answers about that as already, but perfection in love is very different to perfection in knowledge. In fact, perfection in knowledge is actually impossible if you're not God. Only God has perfection in knowledge. So perfection in knowledge is physically impossible for any create, creation of God. Because to be perfected in knowledge, the person would have to be God. And since I am not God, I am not ever going to be perfected in knowledge. But if you're talking about perfection in love, that is a different thing. Perfection in love is, if it is obtained through this process of becoming at one with God. And once you become at one with God, you become perfected in love. And so I, in the first century, spent 30 years not in perfection. I was imperfect for 30 years. And then after I went through that process that made me more and more perfect, I became perfect when I was at one with God. Then I spent the whole years in the spirit world, right the way through to the time of uh, coming back to the earth, in the state of perfection, but still increasing from that state in, in terms of more and more love that I received from God and more and more knowledge and more and more wisdom and more and more abilities were attributed to me as a result of that knowledge. So you become more and more um, closer to God, I suppose you could say, therefore closer to God in knowledge and closer to God in love and closer to God in wisdom and so forth. And then when we returned to earth, we had to, for, a, for some period of time at least, give up perfection again in order to return because to return perfect would have required two perfect parents. In other words, to create a perfect body on earth, there needs to be two perfect parents who are at one with God in order to create a perfect body. So the fact is my two parents, my father, Alan, his name is, and my mother, Maxine, they would readily acknowledge that they're not perfect. And, uh, and as a result, the body they created, uh, the two bodies they created, the spirit body and the physical body they created, are not perfect. And therefore, I also imbibed a lot of their um, emotional condition at the time which also then made, meant that I became imperfect again through the process of returning. And, and here we are defining perfection as perfection in love. Now I'm in a process of growing towards perfection in love again by receiving more of God's love, but also working through the imperfection that I obtain through the returning process or through the reincarnation process. And it's not reincarnation like people on earth believe it to be, as I think we've previously discussed, but it's a returning to earth and incarnating the soul connecting to two new bodies. And those new bodies that were created by my parents were imperfect, and also my parents at the time had imperfect emotions that were out of harmony with perfection from God's perspective. And so I received some of those imperfect emotions, as every child does, and now I'm going through a process of clearing those emotions from myself. So I am right at this moment imperfect and working towards perfection again. Just as I did in the first century, I was imperfect and worked towards perfection and I obtained that perfection when I was 30 in the first century. And I expect to obtain that perfection at some time before I die this century, I'm hoping. But I don't really know whether I will for certain because that depends on how I use my will it depends on what things I hold on to or what things I release. It depends on what I choose to do with the, what, what choices I make. And all of that is very much determined by what happens in the future, in my future. So I'm hoping that I will become perfect because I have a very strong desire to become such, to become at one with God. And, uh, and I'm very sure that that will occur. Um, if I'm given enough time on earth to achieve that. Yeah. Can I just also perhaps comment too that many people expect me to be perfect. 
And I find that quite remarkable, given that they don't expect themselves to be perfect. <laughs> so, you know, most people go, oh, but I'm imperfect. That's, course, that's why I've done this or that's why I've done that. You know, you can't expect me to be perfect. But then when they talk to me, because I'm saying I'm Jesus, they expect Jesus to be perfect. And that's all about belief systems that have been passed down to them, generally from the Bible or their, or their belief systems from the Bible, because the Bible doesn't actually say anywhere that I was perfected in knowledge. It only says that I was perfected in love. Interestingly too, the Bible says that I wanted other people to become at one with God just like I was at one with God. And that, that is said in John 17. So, so that is proof, in fact, that other people could become perfect. And in fact, there is a quote in Matthew, in Matthew 5, at the end of the chapter where it says, you must become perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so I was explaining while I was alive to people on earth that perfection was possible, but only through this becoming, this process of becoming at one with God. And so why anybody ever expects me to be perfect, I do not know. I do not expect them to be perfect until they become at one with God and then they will be perfect. And until I become at one with God, then I will be perfect. But until then, I'm going to be imperfect. So I'm going to make mistakes. How about that? <laughs> and to me, that's not that, it doesn't, it's not that important, actually. To me, making mistakes is how many times we learn, in fact. And so I would encourage people, in fact, <laughs> to make mistakes and, uh, and learn from their mistakes rather than have this constant idea that they must be perfect. There is also a lot of fear on the planet about being perfect. Usually as a child, we are usually violently attacked by our parents. We're smacked and beaten whenever we miss our parents' mark of perfection. And I think that's one of the reasons why people on Earth are so afraid to make mistakes because from a young age, it, they became afraid of making mistakes just in case they might be punished for it at some point in the future. God doesn't punish us for mis sincere mistakes. The, law, the laws that involve the operation of God's universe will soon tell us when we've made a mistake, but God doesn't punish us for the mistakes we make. God hopes that we learn from the mistakes we make. So I don't see any problem with making a mistake. I have no uh, feeling that I, I am unable to make a mistake. And in fact, I encourage people to um, be self-reflective about their mistakes they make, just as I am, am self-reflective about the mistakes I make. Thank you. Okay. So what does your mother and father think about you calling yourself Jesus? Um, their opinions are very different from each other. My father is a religious man. He's a Christian religious man. He's a Jehovah's Witness from the Jehovah's Witness faith. He believes, he definitely believes I am not Jesus. He tries to make a point of telling me as, through his behavior and action as much as possible. <laughs> and mind you, we do occasionally have conversations about different spiritual matters, but that is also something he would not normally engage because his faith doesn't allow him to engage with me. The, his faith believes that I am the worst of all apostates, if you like. And an apostate from their perspective is a person who falsifies the truth, manipulates and deceives. And according to the faith, I am the worst of all people that there could possibly be. Of course, my father doesn't believe that because he knows that inherently I have a good nature and, and that I'm loving with people. So he doesn't take that tack, but he is afraid of the faith's general position. And so, of course, he, he has the opinion generally to take, he takes a lot of care, shall, you say, shall we say, in his interactions with me. We probably only see each other once a year or so uh, with my father, and he generally doesn't phone me or converse with me any other time. With my mother, it's very different. Um, she is fascinated about God's truth, is the best way to put it. And, and so she has a lot of fascination about everything that we teach. She loves to hear about it where possible, but when she's in my father's company, um, often that's restricted. So usually she rings me, phones me. We normally talk once every few weeks on the phone or so. And so she gets to ask her questions then and talk about what's happening you know, in our life then and 
gets to uh, also ask a lot about the teachings through those personal conversations she has with me. So she, although initially was afraid of what I was saying, she, she thought I was somehow you know, delusional at the beginning or she was worried that I might hurt myself at the beginning when I told her that I was Jesus. Now she, she's not worried about any of those things and in fact she's quite fascinated with anything that we discuss. In that regard, both my pa- family, my parents in this life, are very, very similar to my first century parents, in fact, in the terms of the way they responded to my claim. So when I claimed in the first century that I was the Messiah, my father believed I was the Messiah, but didn't agree with me on almost every subject. <laughs> with regard to my mother in the first century, she thought I was crazy initially, and she thought I was delusional. And, uh, and then that changed slowly over time to eventually she, she accepted that I was the Messiah as I claimed, but, it, but she understood it not to mean the Messiah of the Jews, you know, the King of the Jews. She understood that it was about learn, somebody who had learnt about God's love, had personally demonstrated at one minute condition in their life, and then was teaching other people how to become at one with God. So. In that regard, there are similarities between my first century parents and how they've responded to my claims uh, and my, should we call them my 21st century parents, <laughs> and how they've responded to my claims. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I read that... Um, Um, so at what point did you realize, uh, or, and I'm talking about from the, your, your, your child, so when you were a child, um, because there were, there were claims that your mother was worried for you that you had sort of mental health issues? Um, you mean in this life? Yeah. Yeah, because I've been, my, both mothers in my first century life and this life claimed that I had mental health issues. Um, so my first century ma- mother Mary claimed that I had mental health issues quite frequently <laughs> and often she claimed that to protect me she felt from people attacking me and feeling up killing me. In this life uh, my mother um, felt initially when I claimed that I was Jesus that I might have some mental health problem and she decided to go without my knowledge and visit a psychologist uh, and of course he believed that I had some mental health problems and so he then reported me to some authorities and then of course they reported me to my own doctor (laughs) eventually. So nine months later I found out that my mother was concerned that I had some mental health problems in claiming that I was Jesus. So that was nine months after she done all of that. So she was still talking to me and everything but she didn't disclose to me (laughs) that, that she was worried for me. Of course, I went along to the doctor and had a chat with him and he was pretty much fine after I had a chat with him. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, my mother, by the nine month time, felt that I didn't have any mental health problems and she was quite regretful that she'd started the entire process. The entire process resulted in me not being able to receive insurance, uh, which was quite harmful to my business at the time because I was developing property. And so, uh, her choice to do that quite severely harmed my business at the time and 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 therefore even her grandchildren <laughs> and so she um yeah so she, she regretted her decision after that yeah um when uh, when did you actually start having memories of your first century life uh probably as early as two years of age in this life but I didn't attribute them psychologically to to anything. So they just confused me. They were quite sometimes quite extreme memories. What you know, memories of torture and abuse and so forth. Um, and as a result of those memories, I would often I learnt uh, I, until I up until I was around uh, 15 years of age. I learnt by the time I was 15, I learnt to to slot them away to compartmentalize them so yeah, yeah okay. so that came in round about by the time I was 15 yeah 
So by the time I was 15 years of age, I'd learned how to compartmentalize my memories. And what I did with my memories then is I still generally had them, but uh, all I did was put them in like a too hard bin, basically. And uh, I never, and I basically decided to not deal with the too hard bin for the rest of my life at that point, pretty much. But by the time I hit 33 years of age, I found it very, very difficult to, for them to remain in the too hard bin. And I went through quite a lot of distressing period in that part of my life. That's when I left my ex-wife and, uh, and I left the religious faith. And so there were a lot of upheaval in my life. My family wouldn't speak to me. My friends didn't speak to me. My children wouldn't spend time with me because they were taught by the religion that I was now a bad person and could not be spent any time with. And as a result of that, I went through a very you know, difficult period of my life. And, um, and of course, during that period of my life, uh, all of these memories started to resurface, ironically, at a very similar age to my death in the first century. And so there were memories of my death in, you know, during that period of time as well. So it was all quite difficult to address and, and, and cope with. And I still try, I still managed to suppress it down again. <laughs> and when I was around 33, I managed to get it all under control again by the time I was about 34. And then from 34 to 40, so a six year period, I pretty much had the memories under complete control again. I, I didn't uh, try to, you know, remember them at all. I spent most of my time trying to deny them. I developed a business up again. Um, I had four companies running by the end of that period of time. I was working as a computer systems engineer. I ran my own computer consultancy business. I also was working as a developer, a property developer. And uh, by that stage, by, by 40 years of age, I thought I was pretty good. I, I, I hadn't uh, sorted out my personal life in the sense I was not in a permanent relationship but I, or any real relationship at that point. But I had a significant amount of income and I had my own sports car and I had at that stage 13 homes that I owned and uh, along with the subsequent debt <laughs> and uh, I thought I was getting my life under pretty good control actually. Yeah, so, and that's when I started having most of my memories hit me very rapidly and so that was very difficult <laughs> again because uh, I, I, and I actually went through a period where I gave up trying to control the memories rather than, and, and put them back under wraps. And so during that period I decided, well, I've got to resolve this problem. It's now come up quite a number of times. It's come up all through my childhood. It came up when I was 33 and it's come up again when I was 40. So I decided instead this time, instead of trying to put it back under wraps again and keep it all under control, I decided to make a, a choice to go ahead with uh, reorganizing my life so I could have time processing these memories and working my way through them emotionally so that I could get rid of them that way. And so I sold my business at that time and uh, sold most of my property and then spent most of my time alone uh, trying to work my way through the memories and what they all meant. And as a result, I had a lot more memories and, and it became very clear what they meant. It meant that I had the 2,000 years of life that I had memories about and, uh, and it also became very clear to me, you know, that my real identity was Jesus and not Alan John Miller. And Alan John Miller was just a 50-year experience of a 2,000-year life. And, uh, but that took me another three years of processing through lots and lots of memories very, from a very emotional perspective working way through a lot of fear, uh, a lot of worry uh, about other people's opinions, working away through a lot of grief. And eventually um, I sorted out a lot of those particular things and now I don't have a lot of grief um, that I go through now. But I'm still having memories now, so I still go through more memories each, pretty much each day. I, I have more memories about my life. And how did you, do you want to just clip it there? Lightwise all right? Lightwise perfect. Okay, good. And how did you come to terms or how did you deal with all of these emotions? Well, I learnt when I was 33, when I began the process of trying 
to get rid of some of the feelings that I was having, I learned how to process emotions. I was taught by a fellow who helped me how to do that. And I, I recognized the relief that I could feel inside of myself when I processed my way through emotions. And what I mean by processing through is I meant actually experiencing the emotion rather than trying to run away from the emotion. So if I needed to cry, I learned that I could cry and I just let myself cry as long as I needed to cry. And after I finished crying, I realized I felt a lot better, actually. And, and not only did I feel a lot better, but I didn't feel like I needed to cry as much <laughs> as I did prior. So I learned how to process emotion, how to work my way through emotion by myself. And uh, it was a great thing that I learned because, that, because I could apply that to the rest of my life. So, so from the time I was 33 years of age, I began this process of allowing my emotions to flow rather than always trying to suppress them all the time. And that's what helped me greatly uh, come to terms psychologically with everything. Because whenever I was uncertain, in doubt, uh, in confusion, whatever, all I needed to do is feel grief or feel the emotion that I was uncertain about rather than trying to work out what it was about. And then after I felt it, it became clear what it was about. And I realized that that's how everything comes clear for, for any person, in fact. By feeling the emotion, after you've felt the emotion, you realize what it was all about, what, why you felt what you felt only after you feel it, not beforehand. And so this uh, reduced my desire to control with my thoughts how my emotional experience worked. And as a result of that, when the memories came up, I realized all I had to do was just feel the emotions. And so I did. I allowed myself to feel the emotions. So if the emotion was terror, I felt terror. If the emotion was grief, I cried. If the emotion was shame, I felt terrible and shameful. And whatever the emotion was that came up, I just allowed myself to feel it. And after I felt the emotion, it was always clear why I felt it, what the memory was that was triggering this emotion. And, and each time I felt a new emotion uh, or a different emotion, new memories would appear and they would trigger their own emotions, which I would then have to feel. And that process is still continuing for me although with not as much intensity as it first occurred when, I, when it first began. So can you tell me, you mentioned about um, Parkinson's, because, that, because you were holding in your emotions. Yes, when I was 33 years of age, um, most people felt that I had Parkinson's disease. And the reason why is because I had so much fear inside of me that I would just shake like this constantly. My whole body would shake like this constantly. And when I'd be talking to people, I'd be shaking like this, and I'd be, you know, I'd be shaking and shaking. And as a result of that, almost anybody who met me would first ask me, are you all right? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and have you got, what disease do you have? And I, uh, have you got Parkinson's was a, quick, well, it was a common question. And I'd say, no, no. And I'd say, well, why are you shaking then? And then I'd notice that I'm shaking. I wouldn't even notice before then, generally. And I'd notice that I'm shaking and I'd go, oh, no, 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 you know, I'm trying to hold everything in place. And, um, and it was like that when I was 33 years of age. When I was 33, I started processing through a lot of terror. Terror about torture-based events, actually. And I didn't put them in the Jesus basket. So, in other words, um, I, didn't, I didn't attribute them to my being Jesus. I just realized that at some point in my past, and at, at that point in time I didn't even believe I, I, I had a past besides my 33 years of age. I realized at some point in my past I'd gone through some fairly traumatic events. I didn't know what they were, but the memories were of people driving nails through my body and uh, through my ankles and my, uh, my feet and my wrists and uh, people torturing me in different ways and um, uh, like a big stake being driven through my uh, hip on the right hand side and other things like this and and I, and I you know I don't have any of those scars in my body at all uh, now and uh, and so I had no way of intellectually resolving why I was having these emotional experiences but I just decided to feel them and as I felt them the terror disappeared and eventually it got to the point where I had no 
hardly any terror anymore and I was nice and calm and no longer seemed to have Parkinson's in fact <laughs> and uh, and I realized that this was the only effective way for me to deal with what the what the, the illnesses of my body so when I was 33 I also had terrible still had terrible asthma and I had terrible hay fever all the time I was sick every month uh, I had very bad lower back I, I was uh, often bedridden any time, anywhere up to eight weeks at a time with my back, uh, with my lower back. And all these problems disappeared as I dealt with the emotions. Now all of the emotions that I dealt with were all related to my identity as Jesus, but I didn't think that at the time. And I, I didn't know what to think at the time, to be honest. I, I just had, a, had emotions relating to torture and other events, and I, I, don't, I, I thought at the time, well, it's working, it's fixing my body, so what can I do? <laughs> I just went ahead with it and uh, and as a result cured almost all uh, and, uh, and right now I'm down to only three more physical problems in my body when I had just like I was literally riddled with problems in my body when I was 33 years of age so um, so yeah it, it, it cured almost everything, every problem that I had during this process but I still didn't attribute it to having to these memories to psychologically as being Jesus. It, it was just like memories of all of these terrible events um, in a time period that I could not relate to. Uh, I knew that I didn't have any spirits with me, uh, you know, that, that were influencing my choice and decisions. I've never had communication with spirits in my life. Up until then, and and during that period of time, I could feel them as my own experiences, but I had no idea how they were in my own experiences from a psychological perspective. When I was forty and I went through the experiences, it became very clear very rapidly why I had all those prior experiences, because of all the memories that very rapidly came up uh, that fitted everything together. It was like a jigsaw puzzle initially that had a whole, whole heap of disjointed pieces that I eventually just placed together through processing different emotions and eventually uh, and having more memories. And the more memories I had, the more jigsaw puzzles were, appeared that I could put together, the more parts of the puzzle pick, fitted together. And then after a period of time, of course, you get in a jigsaw puzzle, you get to the point where you start making out the outline of the puzzle. And that really bega that began intensely when I was 40. I started to, to make out the outline of the puzzle that it meant that I had a life that I didn't uh, up to that time even believe in. Um, and, uh, and, and then as I pieced more and more pieces of the puzzle together and had more and more memories, I even realized how it all joined together. Like how it appeared, how I'm now Alan John Miller and why and all of those questions as to how it happened and what scientifically occurred you know from a from a um, from a logical perspective uh, how it all occurred as well so and it all fitted together in the end to the point where I could say to people I'm Jesus and I know that I'm Jesus and honestly I remember most of my experience almost all of my experience now so there's little a person can do to convince me otherwise <laughs> Thank you. Um, was coming to terms with the fact that you were Jesus easy? No, very, very hard. Um, and there are many, many times when I just felt like it was impossible to actually even say, even though I knew by that stage what it meant. I just, many times I felt it was impossible to tell another person that that the truth of what I now knew I was very afraid still of other people's opinion of what what they would do if I said I was Jesus I'm completely aware that there are a billion and a half Christians on the planet I'm completely aware of how the majority of those feel about Jesus that they believe Jesus is God um, I'm completely aware that there are other people on the planet who don't even believe Jesus ever existed. And if you look at the, if you analyze anybody's opinions of Jesus um, on the planet today, 
I would say almost categorically that nobody knows who Jesus was. And here I was knowing myself, knowing who I am, and knowing that, that, it, that it basically rubbed out everybody's conception of what was true about Jesus. And knowing that that's me as the individual and, and feeling like that's the last thing I want to do is to share that with anybody. But then there was also this burning desire that was growing to become at one with God again. And I found that every time I suppressed my identity, I disconnected from God. I also found that every time I suppressed my identity, my life became quite messy uh, very rapidly after my own awareness was present about who I was after that it was it was you could say the law of attraction which is a law that God made was showing me all of these things that were problematic with my life whenever I tried to get away from my own identity and so I spent the next three years trying to avoid my identity but at the same time trying to teach God's truth and that was quite difficult because I would, I would, people would invite me to talk at, you know, in homes and stuff like that, and they'd ask me all these questions, and I'd give them, you know, all the logical answers that I give most people, and, uh, and then they'd get the question. Eventually, the question would come, how do you know all of this? And uh, that was always the problematic question, <laughs> because that was the question I didn't really want to answer for some time. and. Uh, Eventually, I got to the point where I answered it in public and with the subsequent rage and anger and, and other emotions that got projected at me. And, and in fact, I can understand the anger in the, some of the audiences at that time because basically I talked to them for four hours about all these fascinating subjects and they became more and more emotionally embroiled in the conversation and more fascinated by the conversation itself only to find out in the end that this nutter in front of them thought he was Jesus, which then caused them to think that was a whole waste of four hours now and they, you know, and they got very disappointed and very upset, as you can imagine. And I learned from that that uh, if, I, if I was not going to be honest up front about my identity, then no matter how many people listened to me by my not disclosing my identity, and there's many more people who listen to me when I did not disclose my identity than when I have, um, I learned that sooner or later they'd find out my identity and, uh, and then probably, as a result of that, discount anything they'd heard anyway. So I found it was far better just to say up front, I'm Jesus. Now let's get on with talking about some other subjects. <laughs> and, uh, and it's very... Very few people have ever asked me questions about my life in the first century or my life in the spirit world or my life now, in fact. The majority of people are either fully confronted of me saying that I'm Jesus and leave immediately or they're totally scared of asking me questions about my life because it might confirm that I could be Jesus and so they, they don't ask me any questions in avoidance of that but they are usually fascinated in everything else with everything else I discuss with them. And as you've probably recognised through your different interviews, the majority of people still haven't resolved uh, whether I'm Jesus or not, and uh, who still come along, even those who come along regularly to any free seminars that we provide, still haven't resolved the question. And sooner or later, I suppose they will need to, um, just for their own sake, because I'm either doing, I'm either lying, I'm either delusional, lying, making fun of them, or actually Jesus, one of those four things, and, uh, and sooner or later they'll have to resolve which one of those four things it is. Yeah. Excellent. I think you actually answered two questions in one there. Um, yeah, because we haven't done about the law of attraction, have we, and the cause and effect? No. Um, it's... Right, okay. How are you doing, Si? Still okay? Yeah, good. Okay. Um... Right. So, um, it's kind of miracles. Um, so, people that are skeptic about who you are, and they can say, "Well, why don't you just do a miracle?" <laughs> yeah, this is a common, common thing. 
firstly, the logic of that question defies logic, actually. It's a totally illogical question. If a person can perform a miracle, the only thing it proves is that they can perform that miracle that they've performed. It doesn't prove their identity. So if a person truly wishes to have me prove my identity, asking me to perform a miracle will not prove my identity from a logical perspective. It only proves that I can perform a miracle. Secondly, in the first century, the only time I performed a so-called miracle, and, I, and in fact, my personal belief is there is no such thing as miracles. <laughs> and to me, there are God's laws and there's knowledge of them. And whenever you perform a so-called miracle, it just means that you know more of God's laws than the average person and therefore can do some things that the average person can't do. That's how I see a miracle. But let's call them a miracle just for the sake of the question. If a person asked me to perform a miracle in the first century, up until I was 30 years of age and at one with God, I could not perform any miracle. I chose to not perform any miracle, in fact, until that point in time. And because the only way I could have performed a miracle before I became at one with God was by becoming overcloaked by a spirit who would perform a miracle through me. And I didn't want to do that. I felt that was a falsification of what was really going on. So, so I waited until I became at one with God. And only, the only miracles that I performed after I became at one with God were with God's agreement. In other words, were with the condition of love associated with them. So I didn't go and perform a miracle just because someone asked me to perform a miracle. I only performed a miracle because I felt love for the person and I knew God's laws in that moment would allow me to cure them from whatever they potentially had, whatever they had. So for example, if I met a blind person and I knew God's laws and, and the feeling within them allowed me to cure their blindness and, and I wanted to cure their blindness and I had a desire to cure their blindness, then God's love could throw, flow through me and cure their blindness. And so they were instantly, could instantly see. And that was something that I wanted to do, not to show off to somebody else. I would have done it whether we were alone or in public. And, uh, and I only wanted to do it because it was an expression of that love that I felt for the individual. So the only time I would perform a miracle anyway is if I felt that feeling of love for the individual enough to actually perform the miracle. And I was at one with God, which I know I am not at this point in time. And I don't know when I will be because I've still got to work through some fears in order to become at one with God. And so it's firstly impossible for me right at this point to perform a so-called miracle. Secondly, I do not believe in miracles. <laughs> I believe there's just more knowledge about God's laws. And as I get closer to God, I'll have more knowledge of those laws. Thirdly, there are some things that people ask me to perform that can never be performed in a state of love. So, for example, turning water into wine. That is not something I ever did in the first century or now and will never do because wine kills brain cells, particularly because it's got alcohol in it, it kills brain cells. I would never create a substance that kills brain cells. Now, other people can do that. That's up to them. And I don't judge them for doing that. That's their choice. But I would not do it. And so I'll never turn water into wine. I might turn wine into water <laughs> at some point. Mind you, that's pretty easy to do given the titration and other <laughs> the physical things you can do to do that. But it, I feel that the majority of people's requests to have a miracle performed are firstly based on a lot of illo illogical th feelings and beliefs they have. And secondly, are based on what they interpret the Bible to say or mean regarding certain things. And many of the so-called miracles that are listed in the Bible, I never performed. And in fact, nobody ever historically has performed, but they are legendary in other books besides the Bible. So, for instance, turning water into wine was something that Greek gods did before I arrived in the first century. And, uh, and so therefore, I had to have turned water into wine so I could be compared to a Greek god. Now, of course, those Greek gods never turned water into wine either because they weren't gods either. They were just people who lived on earth, just like I was. And they never performed miracles such as turn water into wine either. So these are legends that were developed over time. And I was tried to have made to be compared to these particular gods. 
so that people would accept Christianity. And that's a shame because I feel a lot more people would have accepted Christianity if just the truth had been taught. The truth is, God has laws. The truth is, the more of those laws you know, the more you can do. It's like when, we, when mankind learnt how to fly, learnt the laws of aerodynamic, for the very first time we could have controlled flight in our known or recorded history. And before then, the law of gravity seemed to be the, the law that controlled flight. You know, <laughs> you jumped off of something and you just went to the ground. But once we knew the law of aerodynamics, now that law, the understanding of the law, the knowledge about the law, created a miracle. A heavier than air vehicle could propel a person through the air above the ground without them, in a safe manner, without them, uh, you know, dying through the process. And that was unheard of before that time for many thousands of years, just because we learnt the operation of a new law. And what I'm suggesting is that all so-called miracles are only the learning of new laws. That's all they are. The application of new laws from that God has already got in the universe that mankind has yet to discover. So that's the reason why I don't believe in miracles. Okay, everything all right, Si? Yeah.